those kinds of things. And the reality is it has to be hauled. And so we do haul nuclear waste. Um, it's more efficient than, or more, it's far safer than putting it on a highway with a lot of other cars. We are very active in this, the new natural gas, the, the frack drilling. Um, in terms of providing sand, a lot of that's coming right through Ames because it's coming out of Wisconsin and going down to, the, get down to Texas and it's coming through the, the north-south line through Ames. So if you see a short train with lots of open top hoppers, chances are that's a, a frack sand train. It's very heavy as you would expect, so we keep those trains pretty short. And also the pipeline, now, there's been a lot of discussion about um, whether or not a pipeline should be built. Um, we are hauling the pipe that goes to that, but we're also hauling the oil from one location to another. Now, you know, a pipeline goes from A to B, and it always goes from A to B. And if your market changes, you can't move your pipeline. The benefit of rail is if your market changes, you can go wherever the market is. And so we haul a lot of the oil and the natural gas that's being produced here locally in the U.S. And of course, ethanol and distiller dried grains. And here, this proves my point, I think, about Iowa. This is where all of our ethanol producers are located. And you can see the vast majority are right here in Iowa. And wind turbine components that we were talking about earlier. A major distribution location in Manly, Iowa, up near Mason City. The turbines are ordered and then things change and so they're, you know, they're ordered years in advance, they're shipped over here. If for some reason they're not going to go up and be put into power production right away, they're put on the ground and a lot of those go on the ground at Manly because it's a good, good location to distribute from there to sort of the, the area that's producing most of the wind, which is North South Dakota, Montana, and of course Iowa. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about railroads and the economy. The United States freight railroads are the most efficient land transportation system in the world, and that's according to the World Bank. If you look at it, rail rates in the U.S. opposed to any place else, we are the best in the world. And unique among most countries, we are not subsidized. In almost all other countries, Freight railroad, as well as passenger, is subsidized. I am not, I don't have passenger on my list of things to talk about, but we can certainly do that when I'm done. Lots and lots of increase in rail traffic density. <clears throat> Projected demand doesn't stop. Keeps going up. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we really are keeping the economy moving. You can kind of see what we're hauling there. We haul everything. We haul coal, we haul autos. 90% of the autos that are delivered to you, your dealerships come by rail at some point. Raw materials, um, refrigerated goods. We have a, a hot train that goes from the northwest to New York carrying produce. We haul beer, we haul wine, we haul consumer goods. Just about anything that you can think of came by train. What percentage of your uh, revenue or your, or your tonnage is the, uh, are the perishable, the frozen food, et cetera? You know, I don't know for perishables. I can tell you ag is about 18 to 20 percent of our revenue. Um, perishables would be a fairly small percentage of that. And we're looking for ways to increase our market reach. We know that we're, the best thing we do is haul things a long way. We haul heavy stuff a long way. But it doesn't have to be just heavy stuff. And you don't have to have a rail line behind your warehouse to be served by rail. We have a new program, um, UPDS, Union Pacific Distribution Services, that will deal with all the logistics. Somebody calls up and says, I have a car load once a week and I need to get it from my plant to warehouse in, in a Walmart warehouse in Arkansas. And we will help that person get it there, even if they're not rail served. So what we're really pushing for is to figure out how we can use our efficiencies, which is long distance hauling, the most effectively in new markets. Now, those of you who have studied the rail industry for a long time know that unit trains, it was all about unit trains. If you weren't a unit train, we didn't want to talk to you. If you weren't going to haul 50, 50 cars a week, we didn't want to talk to you. That has all changed. We are very much now looking at all kinds of business. The ship cars now, 
We had an employee down in our, our shop in DeSoto, Missouri, a group of employees actually, who once the, the auto industry fell into deep recession, we weren't hauling any cars. We weren't hauling any new cars. So I said, well, you know, everybody's buying old cars. How do we get into that market? So they redesigned these cars so that this platform here is adjustable. It can go up and down depending on what we're going to haul. So if you go to ship cars now, you want to buy a, a car on Craigslist. You want to buy a car from any used car dealer. You go to ship cars now and you say, okay, I need this car picked up in Florida and I need it shipped to Minnesota. We'll get it there for you. That's kind of remarkable for the railroad. That's, that's brand new for the railroad. An individual car, you would do that for them? Yes. I mean, we bring it to a location where we're, you know, where we're condensing cars and putting them into, a, into a larger groups. But yeah, any individual can go to ship cars now and arrange to have their car shipped. So the, re the way we're going to make this work is by investing capital. And Union, this is just Union Pacific, how much we've invested in billions each year. So this year we expect to, enter, to invest three and a half, three point six billion dollars in our infrastructure. That's our, our regular maintenance of way. It's our locomotives, it's our technology, it's our signal system, but it's also new capital investment. Now in Iowa alone, since we acquired the Chicago Northwestern, we've spent more than a billion dollars. What you're looking at right here is the new Kate Shelley Bridge in Boone, Iowa. That was a $50 million project. Within the next five to 10 years, we're going to build a $450 million bridge over the Mississippi River at Clinton. As it stands right now, we have to swing that bridge open multiple times a day for barges and even for tall sailboats. So a sailboat that wants to go north on the Mississippi for a picnic brings the railroad to, to a stop. And that's not a very efficient way to run a railroad. So our plan, that bridge is more than 100 years old. It's time to be replaced. It still works like a charm. It's just, it swings in there just like it was built yesterday. What a piece of workmanship. But it needs to be replaced. And when we replace it, we'll build a clear span bridge so we don't have to stop for traffic anymore. So that's a $400 million project. So our investment in Iowa will go on and on. Those, I'm going to take those questions separately. Um, the old K. Shelley Bridge was a double track, and it was authorized for probably 50 or 60 miles an hour. I don't know any engineers who actually did that. If they, uh, you can answer. That. 45. 45 miles an hour. Okay. Okay. So the old K. Shelley Bridge was a double track, and you could, in theory, meet another train on that bridge at 45 miles an hour, and no one ever did. <laughs> they would somehow just, you know, slip, slip that throttle back just a little bit before they got to the train if they knew somebody was coming. Northwestern would let two trains on there once. So there you go. I mean, it was, you know, it was safe, but it was not fun. And so we, long before 9-11, the plan was in place to build this new bridge. It is double track. It is a 70 mile an hour bridge. It's a very sturdy structure. We, you know, everybody feels completely confident of it. If you go over it on a train, it still is a long way down, but it's a much better structure. Now, the question about Homeland Security, yes. Um, we work very closely with Homeland Security. This route across Iowa, this route you know, just south of here through Ames is considered a national defense um, line. It is critical to the nation's defense. We haul a huge amount of military. You've probably seen some military goods go through here. It's very important to the country that we keep this line open. That's one of the reasons we need to replace that bridge in Clinton. I've got one question on the new bridge. Now, when I worked for Northwestern, on the west end of the bridge, we had a signal for dragging equipment. Do you have a signal at your bridges for dragging equipment or anything like that? There's a whole array out there. And what I mean when I say an array, we have all sorts of wayside detection equipment that detects a dragging load, a shifted load, a bad wheel, 
anything that we can detect on the railroad, we can detect from wayside equipment. Um, and all of those arrays, there's one at Denison, there are arrays staged throughout Iowa so that we can keep track of equipment. If we see, a, you know, it used to be a hot box detector, do I have any old engineers in here who know a hot box detector? Basically that just said, okay, your wheel's too hot. Well now we take the temperature of the wheel, we can track all the way across <coughs> Iowa if the temperature's going up, if it's going up, we're gonna keep a close eye on it, we're gonna see if we need to pull that car out. So it's not just a voice on the radio saying, wheel 42 is hot. Now it's actually a, a very, a driven by GPS, telling you what kind of information you need in order to make good decisions about what to do with a, a failing piece of equipment. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers has come out with, you know, with the report card on the infrastructure of the entire system. How does, how does the rail infrastructure fit into that as far as, as future needs and so on? Obviously you're making improvements, but as far as uh, the general condition of the system. I'm going to talk about that in the next couple of slides. Good tea. Tea up there. Yes, sir. My question regarding uh, bridges. You know, the railroad bridge is a very old, anticipated increase in freight. Do you see a big rebuilding of, uh, of railroad bridges in the future? Yes. We're very focused on building railroad bridges. A lot of our bridges are 100 years old or older. Uh, but we, just like every other transportation entity, we keep a very close eye on our bridges. We test them. We monitor them. We know if we have a bridge that needs to be replaced, then we deal with that. We are in the process of replacing a lot of bridges, but as freight increases, as we get heavier freight, we do pay attention to that. What's the status of the second bridge over the Missouri River in Blair? We are double tracking um, from the only piece of our railroad that's not double tracked across the transcontinental is from Fremont, Nebraska to Missouri Valley, Iowa. And we have a runaround because we have a little roundabout that goes down through Council Plus. Um, that's not a very efficient. We, have to, we lose about 25 miles by not being able to go straight through from Fremont to Missouri Valley. So we're double tracking that. And of course the last piece will be the double track bridge over Missouri. I can tell you, unless things change, the Mississippi will come first. Chicago Northwestern ran on the left, I believe, and you were on the right. Did, did, have you changed the Chicago Northwestern to your system then? That one goes beyond me. <laughs> I know that's true, and I know there's a long story there, but I don't have the story. So, yes, there was the Chicago Northwestern, I think, was the only railroad that operated that way. They yeah. operated on the, with the engineer on the left. And so, yes, I think that we have changed them. I, the entire Union Pacific operates the same. We do not operate differently on the old CNW. Okay, so I wanted to show this because I think there might be some DOT folks in the room. Um, if you're looking at the kind of capital investment that the railroads are making, you see BNSF, Union Pacific, this is for 2011 data, I think. It shows you where the railroads rank against DOT agencies and the amount of money that they're spending on their infrastructure. So the railroads are behind only four states in terms of total amount of money being spent on infrastructure. Okay, now to your question, transportation. So I've talked a lot about the railroad, talked about how things are coming to the railroad because we're cleaner and we're more efficient and we're building and we're, you know, we're funding for ourselves. So now let's talk about how it gets into the whole infrastructure. As I said, there's DOT folks in this room. We all know what's happening with the highway infrastructure and with funding. It's a problem. Um, you can see here that this is a projection from the Federal Highway Administration about where the congestion is going to be in terms of um, highway congestion in 2040. This is kind of a scary map. I mean, even Iowa is going to be congested all the way across the state. Highway traffic is far outpacing highway construction. This is not news to anybody. Okay, so then you start looking about, okay, who pays for highway infrastructure? Well, of course, the taxpayers, whether it's city, state, federal, the taxpayers are paying for one mile of highway. It's estimated about 15 million. Who's paying for a mile of rail? Typically, with that exception that I told you about when the government asks us to do something and there's going to be public benefit, but typically it's the railroad, and it's also cheaper. So, when a boat comes in from China, loaded with boxes, do you want it to go here, <laughs> or do you want it to go here? <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's a better way to, to think about this. 
and where the rail industry is going in terms of its connection with the infrastructure system across the country. Railroads are investing billions of dollars. The rail industry last year invested $12 billion in its infrastructure. It's private funds. It costs us less to build a mile of railroad. Now, it's hard to find a new place to buy it to put a new railroad. Almost impossible, just like it is with new highways. And we're separated, generally speaking, from people who want to go someplace in a car. So if anybody wonders why Warren Buffett bought the BNSF a few years ago, I hope that I've given you some reasons why. The National Rail Plan put forward by the DOT took a long look at how the national infrastructure system is going to fit together in the future. These are kind of their findings. Population's growing, that means freight need is going to grow. Freight and passenger are both critical, but they can't interfere with each other because they are both critical. That in order to be competitive in the world, we have to have a healthy freight rail, um, and that there has to be considerable rail capital investment in order to support that future growth. But so the goal, is to expand rail competitiveness versus trucks. Rail is very good at long distance hauls. We are never going to go to every single Walmart. There will always be a truck at the end of that trip. But truckers are finding it more and more difficult to get long haul drivers. They don't want to spend two or three weeks away from their family. If you're working for the railroad and you're going from Clinton to North Platte or Clinton to Fremont, you go that far and then you get off the train and then you go home. If you have a truck, you get on your truck in Clinton or Chicago and you go all the way to California until you get a new load and then you come back. So you're away from home two or three weeks versus two or three nights. It's hard to get, tru truckers turnover rate is huge. So the railroads anticipate that we're going to haul that long haul. So in terms of projected market shift, you see the distance across the bottom here. This is where the truck market is. Oops, sorry about that. It's supposed to do some magic thing. Anyway, uh, the market shift is supposed to, as we're going to take up a lot more of this. We're going to take this corner of the pie because the trucks do this part well. They do this part really well but they, we do this part really well. And in terms of the way that the infrastructure works across the country, in the interest of infrastructure for all of us, this shift here needs to happen. And that's what, there it did. There, that's the magic thing that's supposed to be. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, on the previous slide, where it said passion versus freight, there's a small print where it doesn't interfere with each other. Is that a polite way of saying the passenger train to interfere with coffee and freight? <laughs> okay, let's talk about passenger. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some statistics. Um, one passenger train, because of the way passenger and freight operates, they don't, we like to keep them a long way apart. I think that's probably pretty obvious. So one passenger train takes the equivalent capacity of three to four freight trains. When Union Pacific, when in 2007, when we were at our peak, we had reached capacity on that bridge at Clinton Iowa. So if we were to run passenger trains on our route across Iowa, we would at a minimum for one freight train, one passenger train, that's not returning, that's just one, take three to four freight trains off. Every freight train equivalent about 300 trucks. Okay, so you have to put a thousand trucks back on the road for one passenger train. And how many people do you think are on that passenger train? Yeah, right. And how many cars did you take off the road for that one passenger train in order to put a thousand trucks back on the road? So, when you talk about freight and passenger not competing, the point is that the capacity of freight rail, even though we're investing billions of dollars, in many places we are at capacity, or because of the studies that you've seen where the freight's going to continue to go up, we expect to be, to reach capacity if we're not there yet. If we give some of that capacity to passenger, there is no way that we can take that long haul freight 
from the trucks. So all that truck traffic is on the interstates. So that's, that's our position in terms of passenger. We don't have any problem with passenger rail. We don't have any concerns with passenger rail. The problem is we need to protect the capacity on our freight lines, because that's our business. We, and, and we owe it to our customers to protect the capacity for their future needs. Well, the FRA or Congress mandated in order to have cross-country passenger service, you'd have to be subservient to the FRA. Amtrak has rights, and I'm sure most of you know the history of Amtrak. You know, the, the freight railroads were going broke, or the railroads were going broke with passenger service, because frankly, nobody was using it. And because of the legal requirements, we had to maintain a certain level of service. We couldn't cease service to many of the lines that, were, that didn't even have passengers on it. So Amtrak was created and took all of that passenger away from the freight. As part of the deal, the railroads said, we will give you reduced rate access to our lines. And we gave them most of our equipment. And um, we gave them priority over freight trains. Amtrak cannot just come in and say, I want that line. There has to be an agreement with the freight railroad. Because essentially, it is private property. And so while we made arrangements with Amtrak back in the 1970s for them to operate over certain lines, and we do have an obligation to Amtrak, they can't unilaterally choose to operate over one of our lines if we're already at capacity. And the government has indicated, the DOT has indicated, that they understand that position. That's why they say in their study, and that asterisk was their words, not ours, that freight and, freight and passenger are both important, but they need to not interfere with each other. Um, asking about mail, we do not haul mail anymore, have not hauled mail for many, many years, but we haul a whole lot of UPS. So those third day packages are coming by train. Oh. After the Staggers Act, there was the many years in which the railroads abandoned the lines, of course, uh, track was abandoned. Uh, what's happened since the sort of plateau there? Has there been a s static or have there been major new lines? There have not been any major new lines built on the railroads. There have continued to be some abandonments. Um, I think, you know, Bondurant, there was an industry lead that went up to Bondurant from Des Moines that was recently abandoned, and well, lots of them go to trails. Um, there will be, you know, there are lines all over the place that we look at to make sure that there's still service on them. Um, in Ankeny, uh, John Deere recently stopped using their track, and so they don't plan to ever use it again. And so that line is under consideration for abandonment. It doesn't, we have a legal obligation by federal law to maintain crossings and maintain track in a certain condition. If we don't have any customers on that line, we're just pouring money into a line that we can't, we can't sustain. That's why there continue to be abandonments. I wonder if you would comment on the Des Moines Register story that ran on the 13th of September that said there are between 30 and 45,000 uh, cars that are formerly oil tank cars that are now carrying ethanol and they have, whereas oil doesn't, you know, unless that inflammable or explosive, ethanol is, and they prefer to use this very dangerous uh, design clause of uh, both ends of the tank. I'm not familiar with that story. Uh, I can tell you that there are a lot of federal regulations for tank cars. Typically, the railroads do not own the tank cars, so it's the, the shipper who owns it who is obligated to, to make sure that the tanks that it's shipping in meet federal standards, federal guidelines, and I'm, I'm going to guess that the government's looking into that. Yeah, they say that this is first observed 20 years ago, and I have particular interest because our back porch is 100 feet away from the track coming down from Story Center. Sure. I can also tell you that the number of incidents on rail is, you know, it's less than half a percent of the freight that we move has any sort of incident. We train um, emergency responders all over the country so that if there is an incident, they know how to respond. So we too do a lot of proactive measures to make sure that if anything were to happen, we'd be prepared to deal with it. Back and back. Uh, I've had a train engineer at Cafe DM, and we had a very interesting talk. And uh, he told me about the uh, coal fields up in uh, northern Wyoming. And told me about how long it took for just to fill one car uh, on the train. And then I didn't understand how far east you guys went with your coal loads. But did you say, have you ever been up to that part of Wyoming yourself? 
I have not seen the mines, but the Powder River Basin coal is the lowest sulfur coal, and the, a lot of the plants that, that burn it, uh, that <clears throat> need to control their emissions, burn that coal. Coal um, operate in cycle trains. So what that means is there's a train that's dedicated to the Peabody mine, and it's dedicated to a power plant in Georgia, and it just goes back and forth, back and forth, never stops. Um, at the peak, we, we, Union Pacific, were hauling about 40 to 45 trains, 110 car trains every day, and BNSF was hauling the same number. So 90 to 100 train loads, each 110 cars, every single day, out of the Powder River Basin. It's amazing there's any ground left in Wyoming. <laughs> but that has dropped off dramatically with natural gas. So our coal is down you know, 20, 30, 40 percent. And some of the, the, you know, we're really starting to see some of the oldest power plants now shutting down, going offline. And so we anticipate, you know, we're, what we now are hauling is frac sand and pipes and turbines and, you know, it's just kind of keeping up with the change. Way in back. I'm just curious, um, you mentioned about the railroad cars, like, for instance, the tank cars, many of them, most of them are privately owned. Uh, what percentage of your fleet are, are, are actually UP cars versus um, privately owned cars, and is the UP getting out of the car building business, or, or you know, having cars that they own themselves, and just going to go to eventually exclusively to just haul other people's built cars? I don't know the percentage of the fleet. Um, it's a fairly, you know, it's, it's not a very large percent, but I don't know what it is. We have um, customers have owned rail cars for many, many years, so that's not a new practice, uh, and it's not changing in any way. We continue to, for certain commodities. For the turbines, for example, there's no single shipper that is going to haul enough that it makes it worth their while to have these cars. So we're hauling from a bunch of diff different shippers. If we get to the point where we have enough from any single shipper, we may ask that they build their own cars. If they don't build their own cars, then that means every all of those wind turbine shippers have to make their equipment in a way that fits into a standard car. And maybe they don't want to do that. Uh, given the tank cars that he was talking about in that uh, category, uh, well, just to use one example of shipping, uh, when the new cars came out, they had, had to be, uh, bed, beds said they had to be a certain way. So those were built. Well, the old cars, they went to the beds and said, listen, we do this, we're going to go out of business. Well, they liked them the way they were. They had to upgrade them a little, but they didn't upgrade them to the specs that the feds have now. And they do have a tendency to do bust open if they have a derailment. They won't, not, maybe not all the time, but they do have a tendency to do that. And that was the one thing that they were really worried about. But the old cars, they, they told them to leave them alone because eventually they'll be out of service anyway. Well, they, they definitely keep a very close eye on that. If I lived 100, 100 feet from the railroad track, it, that would not be what would keep me up at night. It would be the whistles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in recent, just in the last couple of years, the railroads and the federal government have come up with new national standards for bridge and inspections. And is, is this a major change in how railroad bridges are being inspected? I don't know if it was a major change. I mentioned Homeland Security becoming involved and wanting to make sure that we're inspecting things that we didn't necessarily inspect before. Uh, certainly, for the entire existence of all of the railroads, bridge inspection has been a critical part. It's, it's not in our interest to have a, a bridge that's going to have any sort of a failure. So my guess is that there were certain elements that were added because of security issues. For a given shipper, how do you determine the rate for that shipper, especially when <laughs> they don't have access to competing railroad? Um, you know, that is really beyond my ability to answer. The question was how do we determine the rate, and I think that there are a lot of things that go into that. We have competition, um, and as more and more railroads get into the logistical business, it's more and more competitive, regardless of what railroad goes by your, your shop. Um, and certainly trucks continue to be extremely competitive. So while there may be only one railroad in the, at the back dock, there's a lot of competition that require us to keep our rates competitive. <laughs>